Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do want to remind you that you can check out our store, store store.greatdetectives.net, and you can pick up all my audiobooks, ebooks, and uh, paper books all uh, one convenient location. That's store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Richard Diamond, and uh, there are a lot of uh, provinces who will actually list this as the 11th episode, but uh, Dennis at Digital Daily FTP does uh, show this is the next episode that we should be playing, so we'll go with that one. Uh, the title is The Bertram Kalmus Case. The original air date is June the 5th of 1949. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond. If you spotted me on the street, you'd probably figure me for an average working man. But you'd be wrong. I fit the description all right because I break my back six days a week to keep my piggy bank nice and stuffed. But my occupation puts me in a class by myself. I'm a private, honey, nothing in this world but detective. You probably say, so what? The average working man comes under the heading of a lot of different jobs, and you'd be right on that count. But there's one little thing that puts me in a class all by myself. Trouble. Mr. and Mrs. Average John Doe work six days a week to keep clear of it. I put in the same time playing footsies with it. It's a kind of silent partner with references dating all the way back to the year one. People get in trouble every second, and I count on a small percentage to come to me to get them out of it. The rest? Odds and good advertising. As an example, take the other night in a little bistro over on 48th Street. A couple of guys sitting at a back table were getting set for a special brand of trouble. The big kind that you find under the heading of murder. Oh, Bert, old boy, this is turning out to be a wonderful evening. I'm glad you're enjoying it, George. Yes. Say, who's a blonde over there in the booth? Hmm? Well, I've never seen her before, but she's cute. Yeah, she sure is. Good evening, baby. Oh, George, George, take it easy. Maybe she's waiting for somebody. Oh, don't be silly. Look, she's smiling. (laughs) Let's ask her over to the table. Well, huh? I still think she's waiting for someone. If you want to take the chance, go ahead. You ask her. All right, I will. <laughs> I uh, said good evening. Good evening. Uh, my friend and I noticed you were sitting alone, and uh, we wondered if you'd join us. Oh, I don't believe I can. You see... Oh, please, just for a few drinks? No, really. Uh, Thank you just the same. Well, if you say so, but I'll be unhappy for the rest of the evening. Hi, baby. Tony. I'm sorry I took so long, but... Hey, who's this guy? Now, Tony. I said, who's the guy? Uh, If you'll excuse me. No, you wait a minute. Uh, George, come on. I think we'd better leave. This guy a friend of yours? Yes, he is. Was this guy making a pitch, man? No, he only asked me over for a drink. Oh, he did, huh? Now, wait a minute, pal. Please, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. So you made a mistake. Well, I don't like jokers that try and pick up my girl. Hey, wait a minute. You didn't have to slug him. Maybe you'd like to do something about it. Maybe I would. Uh, Well, that's the first time Tony ended up on the short end of a fight in a long time. All right, George. Yes, I think I cut my head. Yeah, you're bleeding all over the place. You better get out of here, mister. I saw the manager duck in the back room. He's probably calling the car. Here, let me give you a hand, George. Here now, take my hat and wear it over the cut until you get home I'm getting out here too You want me to drop you off? Uh, What about your boyfriend? He's still unconscious He was that way when I met him 
You want the lift or not? Yeah, what about you, Bert? Oh, I'll be all right. I'll go on and let her take you somewhere so you can get cleaned up. I'll grab a cab and head for my place. I'll call you in the morning. But I don't now want Now, stop to... arguing. You can't afford a scandal. Well, all right. Come on, honey. Let's go. Very nice apartment. You better go get cleaned up. Uh, back to that room. I'll get a couple of drinks. I can sure use a drink. I won't be long. Take your time. Yes. Tony, get out of here. Where is that guy? Come on, get out of here. Why, you cheap little... I'll beat it out of you. Let go of me. Take your hands off me. You ah! Take your hands off her. Help. I'll kill the both of you. Help. There's a gun in the stairs. A gun? All right. I'll wring your little neck. Oh. You shot him. I did? You better get out of here. Yeah, but uh, what about you? Go on, get out while you can. I'll think of something. Yes. Yeah. Leave the gun. I'll throw it the river or something. Hmm? Oh, all right. Now go on, beat it. You just killed a man. <laughs> Yeah, come in. Hiya, Mr. Diamond. Well, Hennessy, what did you do, wreck your cab? Nah, it's down in the front. Hey, that's a warm magazine you're reading there. Yeah. Listen to what it says here about women's bathing suits. Huh? 1949 suits allow maximum exposure to sun. Note plunging neckline. <laughs> Note. Who's going to miss it? If it plunged in the lower, it'd wind up at the bends. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Mr. Diamond, would you mind shoving it in the drawer? The picture distracts me. Mm, not at all, no. I, I don't blame you, Hennessy. Thanks. Now, what's on your mind? This. A hat? Yeah. Well, I don't think I can do you much good. What did you bring it to me for? I found it in the gutter over in Flatbush. So what? Some guy loses a hat. Don't tell me you want me to find him. No, I, I just got to worrying a little, you see. I, I found this beside... Oh, a thirty-eight. Well, let's have a look. Take a look at the hat, too. It's got blood all over the inside. Yeah. And initials on the inside. BK. Gun's been fired. You can still smell the powder in the barrel. Why didn't you take this to the police? Oh, I didn't want to get mixed up in it. You see, I got to pick up as many fares as I can. I ain't got nobody to drive my cab for me, and I didn't want to spend the day answering questions down at headquarters. You understand? Well, you'll probably have to anyway. I'll have to notify them. Yeah? Well, I, I thought maybe you could find out who owned the hat and maybe solve the case before you notify him, you see? That way I wouldn't have to spend too much time. I could just tell him I found it and beat it. Well, I can't withhold evidence. It'd take away my license. And if you did, they'd lock you up. Okay, I, I just thought well, maybe... Well, I can check the hat store before I get to the 5th Precinct. Yeah, well, uh, won't that be a tough job? There's a lot of hat stores, well, you this know. this hat's got a label. Besides, when someone finds a bloody hat with a thirty-eight lying next to it, I, I get interested. Particularly when there isn't a corpse to go with it. Yeah. Well, I gotta go, Mr. Diamond. Thanks a lot. You got a free ride any time you want it. I may take you up on that. So long, Hennessy. Well, there you are. What did that tell you? When you're working with trouble, something always shows up. Sometimes it's just a routine case. A guy knocks off his wife and he comes to you because he suddenly found out that he had that lonely feeling. Or maybe you get a real screwy one. A taxidermist that got tired of stuffing animals and went to work on a neighbor. Or then you get one that gives you the same feeling you get when you pick up a poker hand and the first four cards you look at are all spades. Well, I was holding two cards. A hat with blood on it, a gun that had been fired, and all I needed to fill out the hand was a body. By all rights, I should have taken the evidence right down to my friend, Lieutenant Levinson, at Homicide. But I didn't have anything to do, so I decided to see what kind of pieces I could fit into the puzzle. The label in the hat was from a store on Fifth Avenue. It wasn't far from my office, so I walked it. Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? Yeah. Stop munching your sensen and tell me if this hat is from your store. Well, let me see it. These glasses are not telescopes, you know. Yeah. Here. Well, if you're planning to return this merchandise, sir, I can assure you the store will not accept it. 
You've been bleeding on the sweatband. Look, Rosebud, I just want to know if the hat is from this store. It most certainly is. It's one of our custom models. Who did you sell it to? If you found this hat, we will be glad to return it to its owner. We are not supposed to give out the names of our clients. I have a small badge here that should cut this conversation down to a few words. See? Oh. Now, would you mind telling me to whom did you sell this hat? Well, just because you're a detective, I am not impressed. However, under the circumstances, I'll give you the buyer's name. You're a real sport. I suppose you wear a shoulder holster, too. Or is that bulge your tailor's fault? Psst. Come here. I really keep a midget in there. You don't say. Yeah. He spits through the lapel of stupid hat clerks. Oh, really? Now, come on, bright eyes. Who bought the hat? Well, if you'll just hold your horses. That's the new line, if I ever heard one. Come on, Bubbles. Yeah. Here it is. This hat was sold to a Mr. Bertram Calmus. We make all his hats for him. Well, bully for you. What's his address? 430 Sutton Place. Now, will that be all, sir? Yes, that will be all, and thank you. You've been a brick through the whole ugly mess. I left him watering his gardenia and headed for the residence of one Mr. Bertram Calmus. The apartment house was about ten blocks away, and with the money I had in my pocket, all taxicabs started looking like iron claws with four wheels. I walked. Yes? How do you mean that? Yes, I don't want any. Oh, and I've got a pretty good sales talk. I never buy anything unless I have a demonstration. My middle name is Semper Paratus. Like the Coast Guard, I'm always prepared. I suppose I could top that, but I'm getting tired of trying to close the door on your foot. What is it you want? I hate to admit it, but I'm looking for Bertram Calmus. My husband. Good for him. Is he in? No, but he will be any minute. And for the boss. This hat, I believe, is his. What blonde's apartment did it turn up in? It was found in a gutter in Flatbush. Well, Flatbush is a little out of his territory, but the gutter sounds familiar. It's that stain all over it. Blood? Does your husband bleed a lot? Not recently. We've been getting along. Are you from the police? I'm a detective. Oh, come in. Mm, I'd hate to be selling brushes. I'd have slammed the door on your face. Oh, well, then I made an impression. Perhaps. Let's just say you're waiting for a sacrifice to move you to second base. Won't you sit down? Thanks. What happens when I round third? And that depends on your batting average. Diamond, Mrs. Calmus. That's it. Now, getting back to a very dull subject, does this hat belong to your husband? I don't know. It looks like one of his. Has it got any initials in the band? Mm-hmm. BK. When did you find it? I didn't. The cab driver picked it up this morning. And it isn't my husband's blood. He left about a half an hour ago to do some shopping, and he was very bloodless. No cuts on his head? No cuts. He came in around two this morning. He'd been drinking, but he wasn't cut up. Oh, there he is now. I hope he can discuss baseball under the time. Oh, I got all the things you wanted in it. Um, Bert, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Yeah? Well, how are you? Fine, Mr. Calvin. Tell me, is this your hat? My hat? Let me see it. Why, no. No, it isn't. The hat store on Fifth Avenue says it's older to you. Well, I can't help what they say. That's not my hat. Are you sure, darling? It was found in a gutter. I don't care if they found it on a Yale man in the Harvard Club. It's not mine. Well, I guess I'll have to take your word for it. Uh, wait, wait. Isn't that blood on the hat? Mm, yeah. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Calmus. Mr. Calmus, nice meeting you both. I'll see you to the door. I can do it. I know you can, dear. Coming, Mr. Diamond? Sure. Goodbye. Come back again, Mr. Diamond. Well, goodbye, Mr. Calmus. Where? Where can I call you? What? I can't explain now. Where can I call you in about a half an hour? My office. It's in the book. You'll hear from me, but please, please don't do anything until then. Okay. Half an hour. Then I go to the police with this hat. Bus. Uh, Mr. Diamond, this is Bert Calmus. Yeah? Uh, yes, I, I couldn't say anything to you in front of my wife. That is my hat. Oh, I thought so. Why did you deny it? Well, I was out with a pal last night. There was a fight over a girl. I didn't want to mention it in front of my wife. Oh, how did the blood get on the hat? My friend got hit on the head, and I loaned him my hat to cover up the wound. What was it doing in a gutter in Flatbush? I really don't know. My friend left with the girl, and I went right home. 
Mm. Well, who is this friend of yours? I think something may have happened to him. Well, I called him this morning, and he seemed very nervous about something, and he asked me to come over. I'm in the lobby of this hotel right now. Ah, uh, he's probably just worried about the girl he picked up. As long as the blood on the hat was from a cut on his head, I don't think there's too much to worry about. No, no, Mr. Diamond, I, I think it's more than that. He's my employer, and I know him pretty well. I do wish you'd come over. Well, all right, Mr. Kalmus. What's the address? The Whitsitt Hotel on East 54th Street. I'll meet you in the lobby. Don't ask me why I started getting that lousy feeling when all I had was a bloody hat, a gun, and a pretty good explanation for one of the items. But there it was, that jammed up feeling in the pit of my stomach like I just swallowed a whole pineapple. Something was wrong, and I wanted to find out what. So I hurried over the, to the Whitsitt Hotel and met Calmus in the lobby. I'm glad you came, Mr. Diamond. I just put in a call to George's room and someone else answered. So what? Well, the man asked a lot of questions, like who I was and why I... What did I want with George? And... Oh, I, I take it George is your friend of last night. Yes, George Watkins. He's the president of the firm I work for. Well, let's go up. When someone starts asking questions like that on the phone, it begins to sound like the police have moved in. Come on. Yeah. Oh, hello, Walt. Rick, what are you doing here? Fair question. I'll answer yours if you'll do the same for me. I came up to see a Mr. George Watkins. So did I. Well, what's the matter? Is George in some kind of trouble? Who's this guy? Oh, he's a friend of Watkins. Works for him. Oh, yeah? Well, come on in. George. George, what's going on here? You better let the lieutenant tell you, Bert. I can't think anymore. What's the charge, Walt? Murder. Uh, hmm? Murder? We got a call from a girl last night who said a man named George Watkins killed someone in her apartment. When we got over there, we found the girl there, too. Oh, well, you must have the wrong man, Inspector George. Lieutenant. Wouldn't... And I'm sure you think George wouldn't, but he just confessed. George? Yes, Bert, I killed the man. <laughs> but I, I didn't kill her. The man came in and tried to strangle her. She told me to get the gun in the drawer, and when the man wouldn't let her go, I shot him. That isn't what the girl told us. She said she took this gun home, this guy home, after he'd been in a fight, and when they got to her apartment, he made a pass just as her boyfriend came in. Then Watkins shot him and ran out. We figured he got excited, and when he had time to think about it, he went back and killed the only other witness. I didn't kill the girl. I never went back there at all. I came straight here. Uh, Walt, Mr. Kalmus here was with him up until the time he left with the girl. Is that right, Mr. Kalmus? Why, yes, sir. Now, there was a previous fight, and Watkins got that cut on his head. Mr. Kalmus loaned him his hat to cover the wound. That's right, sir. And, uh, oh, by the way, Walt, what caliber was the murder weapon? Thirty-eight. but we haven't found the gun yet. Here, check this one with ballistics. How'd you find this? Cab driver named Hennessy brought it into me this morning. Found it lying with a hat. Did you ever see this gun before, Watkins? No, I, I told you I don't own a gun. Well, what time do you figure he killed the man and the girl? The coroner fixed the time of death about one o'clock this morning. Mm. How long were you at this girl's apartment, Mr. Watkins? Why, about five minutes before her boyfriend came in. I shot him and left immediately. And you don't remember taking your hat or the gun? What are you getting at, Rick? This is an open and shut case. He admits killing one of them, but he won't admit the other killing because he knows it was premeditated. Oh, just a hunch, Walt, just a hunch. Mr. Watkins, would you mind telling me just what happened after the girl's boyfriend started choking him? Well, I grabbed a gun out of the dresser near the kitchen and I shot him. And the girl told me to get out, that she'd take care of things, so I dropped the gun and ran. Did you hear anything else? Anything unusual? No. But, yes, now that you mention it. I did hear something, but it slipped my mind until now. What did you hear? Well, I, I don't know whether I can describe it or not. It uh, sounded like someone had opened a bottle of flat champagne. What are you getting at, Rick? Oh, wait a minute, Walt. When did you hear this noise? Right after I shot the man. I remember wondering if someone hadn't opened a bottle in the kitchen. Is that where the noise came from? Uh, yes, I think so. Hmm. All right, if I go over and case the scene, Walt? We've done that. Yeah, but you weren't looking for something. Why don't you come with me, Mr. Calamus? I'd like to talk with you. What's the address, Walt? 16 West 113th Street. Well, now, look, don't worry too much, George. I can handle the business, and in the meantime, I'll do everything to get you off. Thanks, Bert. Now, you wait a minute, Rick. If you think you know something... Walt! Yeah? Bye. Calamus and I went downstairs and took a cab over to 16 West 113th Street. It was a middle-class apartment house in Flatbush, a four-story brownstone. I let Calmus pay the fare, and we went in. I wonder what floor it's on. Well, she'll tell on the mailboxes. 
Yeah, here it is. Nan Phillips, 206. Well, let's go up. Oh, uh, what do you do for Mr. Watkins? I'm his vice president. That's why I took him out last night. I wanted to interest him in a new account. I just can't imagine him killing anyone, but I guess people do funny things when they lose their heads. Oh, no. 206. Oh, here it is. Yeah? Hello. Oh, no. Good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. What do you want, Diamond? Well, I want to stand out here in the hall and count the hairs in your five o'clock shadow. Now, let us in. The lieutenant said it was all right. Okay, comic. Mr. Calmus, meet Sergeant Otis. How are you? Hello, Sergeant. Otis, make like a policeman and point out the circumstances in this killing, will you? Well, I don't know why I should, Shamus, but if the lieutenant sent you over, I guess I'll have to. Hmm. Two bodies was over there by the window, lying pretty close together. Uh-huh. The killer, that Watkins fellow, was standing about here in the center of the room. With his back to the kitchen door? Yeah. He shot them both from about here. Hey, what are you looking for? Oh, I like to get out on my hands and knees. It's cooler. And it won't do you no good to start looking for fancy clues. The guy already confessed. Well, 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 well. Hey, what do you got there? Just a wad. So, you got some wadding from the murder gun. You better give it here. Sure. But hang on to it, Otis, and be sure to give it to the lieutenant... Maybe you haven't noticed, but murder guns don't throw this much wadding unless you can kill someone with a blank cartridge. What? Uh, don't let it throw you. Mr. Calmus, I've got some things to do. Can I drop you somewhere? Well, no thanks. Now that Mr. Watkins can't take care of the office, I'd better go down and check over some things. But I'll keep in touch with you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, you do that. And now, wait a minute, Diamond. Oh, stop trying to figure it out, Otis. You'll snap your wig. I was getting close to something. I wanted to tie the ends together before it caught up with me. I had a big, fat hunch that Watkins had been framed good, and the more I found out, the more it looked like a killer was still loose. The whole setup had been screwy from the first. Why would a guy lose his hat and drop his gun in the same place? Or, if he threw them both away, why wouldn't he burn the hat and throw the gun in the river? Nobody's frightened enough to lay them side by side in the gutter. I learned a lot since this morning, and I was certain of one thing. The killer tried to make it look good. But he was an awful amateur. I knew something else, too. Amateurs can be awfully mean sometimes when you corner them. I put in a call to Walt and told him what I had, and then I asked him to give me half an hour and, and meet me at Mrs. Kalmus's flat. I grabbed another cab, and 20 minutes later, I was sitting on a long couch next to Mrs. Kalmus. It's easy to get that crowded feeling, even on a long couch. You just both sit on the same cushion. Comfy. Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of perfume is that? My sin. Past or future tense? A rounding second. Mm. He brought you back, Stan. Oh, I, uh, I want to ask a couple of questions. Past or future tense? What time did your husband get in last night? I told you, about two o'clock. Why? Do you know if he knows a girl named Nan Phillips? I really don't know. Oh. Well, all right. Just a few more questions, and then we'll get back to that perfume. I'll think they good. You said you'd been getting along with your husband. Would you mind explaining that? Certainly. I like nice things, and lately he's been buying them for me. Oh. What's your husband's salary? About 15000 a year. Oh, could he afford to buy you these things? Well, he told me he was getting a raise, and then he'd gotten a bigger fan. What's this all about? Maybe I'd better tell you. Bert, I didn't hear you. I did. What are you doing with that gun? I'm going to use it. I found Mr. Diamond making passes at my wife, and I shot him. Are you crazy? Don't ask him that. He's allowed to start thinking about it. You can't shoot me and get away with it, Calmus. What are you going to do with your wife? She won't back you up. No. No, I guess she wouldn't. All right, both of you, get up and walk downstairs to my car. Bert, what are you doing? Your husband killed two people last night, Mrs. Kalmus. Now he's going to try and cover because he guessed I knew how it was done. You're not going to kill me, too. Get moving. Bert, please. Go on. as he says. Why did you kill anyone, Bert? He wanted to frame his boss. I'll bet when the company checks, they'll find out he's had his hand in the till. They won't find out, Mr. Diamond. With Mr. Watkins' book for murder, I'm next in line for president. I'll be able to fix the book so it will look like he took the money, too. Is that where you got the money for all those things you've been buying for me? You shot the man and the girl from the kitchen with a silencer, didn't you, Bertram? That's right. I knew you were onto something when you discovered that wad from the blank cartridge. I was onto something a long time before that. Yeah? 
All right. Come on. Over to that gray sedan. And remember, I've still got this gun in my pocket. Ah, you're an amateur, Bertram. Is that right? Sure. I knew you had something to do with it when we got over to the girl's apartment. I didn't know what floor it was on, and you looked in the mailboxes. That's the best way to find an apartment, isn't it? Yeah, but not once at any time did anyone mention the dead girl's name. But you knew it and found it on the mailbox. All right, stop right here. (laughs) Open the door, Jean, and get in first. The front seat. Please. Get in. All right. Now you, Mr. Diamond, you're going to drive. You know, I left my license in my other suit. Stop stalling. I had to do something to stall for just a second because over Bertram's shoulder I spotted a prowl car sliding up to the curb and good old Walt was climbing out. Uh, uh, Bertram, would you mind answering just one question? What is it? The gun that Watkins thought he killed the man with was loaded with blanks, wasn't it? Sure. I killed the guy from the kitchen with a silencer. The whole thing was rigged, huh? The man and the girl were supposed to stage that fight and Watkins was supposed to shoot the guy with the dummy slug. You said one question. Now get in the car. All right, Thomas, don't move. What? Why, you... Just break... That was a close one. You're so right, Walt. Take his gun. I think you'll find it's the one that Watkins fired the pranks from. How is he? On his way. Hey, Bertram. I'll go call the wagon. Bertram. Yes? You want to tie the ends together? I... I paid the girl and the man to stage the fight. I told them... I wanted to frame George and blackmail him. So you framed him with a double murder instead. Why? I've been stealing money from the company. How'd you know it was me? Well, knowing the girl's name, for one thing, and your wife told me you'd gotten in about two. You told me over the phone you went straight home after the fight in the cafe. The killing took place about one. Watkins Uh... said he'd been at the girl's for five minutes. About 15 to get to her place, so that meant you all left the cafe around 12.30. It doesn't take an hour and a half to get... Hey, Bertram. John. Huh? I don't think Bert can hear you. Yeah. Well, it was a pretty dull story anyway. Well, the wagon got there, and I briefed Walt on everything that had happened. They took Mrs. Calmus home and released Watkins. It was a stinking hot afternoon, and I needed something cool to bring me down to normal, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue. A tall lemonade with a mind of its own, and a covetous redhead with the same gimmick. Yes? Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. Afternoon, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the study reading. Thanks, Francis. Oh, uh, how about something cool? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Hi. Hi. Well, you look cool enough. That's a nice getup. You like it? It's the newest thing. Yeah, I uh, saw it in the magazine. What do you do if it shrinks? Oh, silly. No, no, I'm concerned. You might get raided. Don't you like it? Yes, ma'am. What do you think of me? Ah, oh, you're adorable. You're beautiful and you're cute. Hey, that sounds like a song. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Come here. No, not nice sing it. It's cute. That's too hot. I'm rather cool. Well, I was only lukewarm until I spotted that play suit. Go on. A, you're adorable. Okay, but uh, then I want to play. <laughs> Get it? Play? Play suit? <laughs> that was then. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Go on. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. C, you're a cutie full of charm. D, you're a darling. And E, you're exciting. And F, you've got feathers on your arm. Oh, Rick. G, you look good to me. H, you so heavenly. I, you're the one I idolize. J, we're like Jack and Jill. K, you're so kissable. L, there's the love light in your eyes. Rick. M, hmm? Do you want me to finish? I love you. Oh, you see. Mm-hmm. Hey, just one moment, sir. Uh, yes, Francis? I'm not going to be embarrassed again. Here's your lemonade. Uh, thank you, Francis. Oh, it's nothing, sir. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Byron Kane, Lorene Tuttle, Paul Fries, and Wally Mayer. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hello again, it's Jennifer Moss, author. My love of detective stories inspired me to write Town Red, the first in a series of mysteries with a metaphysical twist. Check out the rave reviews on Amazon. Just search for Town Red by Jennifer Moss. Now back to the show. You're listening to the great detectives of old time radio with your host, Adam Graham. Welcome back. Well, a somewhat different uh, role from Wally Mayer than we heard him in yesterday as Sergeant Grab, but definitely made for a very um, interesting uh, murderer. His guilt wasn't apparent from the beginning, but I think did become more so as the episode rolled on. Well, uh, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we do have some feedback regarding the Avenger. Brian uh, writes in, sad to hear this is coming to an end. It had a bit of a rocky start, but you said it would get better, and it did. And uh, Jennifer agrees, says, uh, I was really skeptical at first, but have uh, really have been enjoying it. Well, thanks so much, uh, Brian and Jennifer. And uh, I'm glad you enjoyed The Avenger. It was certainly a series I was glad to bring you. And uh, it had a little bit of a uh, feel of the shadow in it, but with a very solid um, mystery basis to it that made it a great fit for our series overall. Now, a reminder that The Amazing World of Radio does continue the special six-week limited edition podcast. And you can subscribe at amazing.greatdetectives.net. This week, uh, we are featuring a couple episodes of The Les Paul Show. So uh, go ahead and have a listen to that. Coming up tomorrow, Boston Blackie. And be sure and listen to us next Wednesday for another episode of Richard Diamond. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and uh, become one of our friends 